Okay, so today we'll continue on with the VMM. Like I said, this VMM sections of this course is uh, all about managing larger environments than uh, what we've been doing individually on the Hyper-V uh, servers. Okay, so obviously with regards to your assignments, uh, I would be very, very surprised uh, if you actually incorporated VMM into your uh, design of your uh, for the scenario that we're giving you because obviously the the company we're talking about is if he's confectionery and we've uh, we've sort of grown and uh, to know know it quite well and we know that it's not large okay in fact its core business is not even IT or information per se uh, it's more so that part of it the information and IT is a supporting part of uh, supporting fun service for the main function, which is to actually make and sell lollies. So you'll find that companies like this would probably incorporate virtualization because it's just very efficient, very cost effective and all that kind of stuff, but would not include the VMM because it simply does not justify the cost of it or they would not, uh, as well as they, the fact that they would not have enough host to make it actually worthwhile because you do waste a lot of resources in creating the VMM uh services itself if you remember we talked about how with vmm the virtual machine manager it's a system center tool so it's like a suite of tools that controls various aspects of the virtualization infrastructure from the one area so what does that mean that means that uh, we're really going to have a vmm server that's doing nothing more than doing management we're going to have a sql server it could be on the same VMM like we've got in our scenario, but ideally it will be on a different server and that's to store the configuration and information coming from the VMM uh, server. So really you're effectively having two servers or virtual machines, which are servers, uh, really doing not much more than for management. And for a small company, that uh, certainly does not justify that expenditure of resource and cost for the licensing as well as everything else for the amount of host they probably would be virtualizing and for the amount of virtual machines they will be managing. So I would be very, very surprised if anyone in their ass migration assignment recommended the use of VMM. Okay, uh, so just to touch base on that. So really what I'm saying is you could pass this subject without knowing too much or delving too much into what VMM is. Just a, uh, it's more of a completion of the topic in the sense that uh, you know Hyper-V, you know it's a virtualization tool and it's it's just another variant of something we really understand. There's some differences, some similarities, but just like in VMware where we looked at VMware Workstation, but to go on to that next level, it's all about v vSphere and the two vSphere and VMM are very similar because the vSphere, you have a vCenter server, SQL database, which are there to manage all the hosts so that you can actually uh, manage and configure uh, configurations which are for the whole infrastructure rather than individual host by host configuration. But let's get on with what we're talking about today. Today we're going to look at managing the infrastructure with VMM. So last lesson we talked about installing VMM and getting it onto our systems. So today we're going to look at the networking infrastructure, the storage infrastructure, and also updates, infrastructure updates, as well as Hyper-V clustering in, the, in relation to VMM. So, so, uh, so in this networking infrastructure, so what we've done before in the first half of the subject was to work with individual Hyper-V servers. So you might remember that we would actually create a, a virtual switch in Hyper-V1 and we would create the same virtual switch in Hyper-V2. So if you remember, we created that corp virtual switch. You see how we, if we had two, we did it twice. We, if we had three, we'd do it three times. If we had 20, we'd do it 20 times. And if we had 100 or 1,000, we would do that same configuration 100 or 1,000 times. So you, you guys sort of getting that idea, it's a bit like the peer-to-peer -peer networking versus a server client networking, where you, if you remember peer-to-peer, -peer, you did the management of each workstation on each workstation, whereas with a server client uh, 
a, a system, you do the management and administration from the centralized server, like the Active Directory server with the user accounts at least. So it's a bit like that same idea. If you like to think of it, when we had just Hyper-V, even though they were in a domain, they were almost like a peer-to-peer -peer network of Hyper-Vs where you have to do the management configuration on each Hyper-V. I'm not saying that you couldn't go administer the other Hyper-V from the same console. Of course you could. We did that. We connected to the other one. But the fact that is, for example, when we create a virtual switch, we're not creating it once. We're creating it once on each a Hyper-V server. And you can you can just imagine if we had a thousand that is just going to get very annoying. So v, with VMM, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize that that wastage of effort and time. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to configure networking infrastructure uh, on the VM, which, which actually incorporates all the uh, hosts that we want to incorporate and define it across the board. So if we look at this slide, working with VM uh, with virtualization infrastructure, so VMM, Virtual Machine Manager, it's a system center virtual machine manager to be precise. Uh, infrastructure contains the components that makes the virtualization. Obviously, these things, like any virtualization, it's networking, it's storage, it's processing power. Uh, uh, so VMM infrastructure servers, which is basically the processing power, uh, so basically any with a VMM agent. So for those of you who've done the SCCM subject with me, you would understand the term agent. Agent is basically a bit of software that gets installed onto the machines or computers that we're trying to manage. And what it does is it allows this communication, two-way communication between the management server, VMM, and the server that's being managed, which in this case are the Hyper-V servers. But also, beyond that, there's also library servers. Okay, they're not Hyper-V servers. They're actually servers which contain resources that you will use in the creation and management of your virtualization infrastructure. For example, you could have an ISO. Okay, so for example, we know that we installed our guest operating system with ISOs, and we would, if we need, if we had a, if we would need these ISOs, we put in the library server, and it will be available on any of the hosts. Other things in the library server includes profiles, templates, and all, all those other kind of things. So basically think of it as a resource server which contains the things we would want to use during the creation and management of virtual machines or virtualization. Then there's the host servers, which are the workhorses. So they're the Hyper-V servers, so we're calling, calling them the host servers. They are the ones that actually are doing the work the CPU, the processing power, the RAM, that's on the host servers. And they can be configured in host groups, which effectively are groups of hosts. So instead of treating each one individually, you can treat them as a group. Okay, because we're not, like I said, we're not talking about small implementations with VMM now. We're talking about very large implementations. So you're not really wanting to deal with individual hosts anymore. You want to deal with groups or blocks or whatever you want to call it. It's a bit like the idea of if you in Active Directory where instead of giving users rights or permissions, you give groups permissions, which means you don't have to deal with the hundreds of or thousands of users. Then we have PXE servers. So uh, again, for those of you who did the SCCM subject, you'll know that PXE stands for pre-execution environment, uh, which basically is a network boot server. Okay, so what does that mean? Basically, it sort of incorporates the bit like the SCCM subject. Instead of actually installing hosts, the operating system hosts individually, one on one, etc. Remember how I said the term that uh, that Hyper Vs or hypervisors were cattle, not pets. Remember, if you remember, I said that because we said that we don't really uh, care about the uh, the cattle. It's a resource, it's valued, it's, does a, it has a function. But to be honest, we're not going to spend the time or money caring for it if it gets sick, just like we would with our pets. In fact, if a cattle, which is just a resource, gets sick, I know it sounds a bit cruel, and excuse me to anyone who gets offended, but they, usually the farmer just puts them out of their misery. Okay, because they're a resource, and if their resource is not it's a problem, don't need to spend any more time or, or money on it. 
get rid of it. But the thing is, with the PXC boot, boot servers, uh, with in conjunction with the network deployment uh, servers, which we use in SCCM to deploy operating system, we could just quickly deploy a new Hyper-V onto that hardware even after we killed it. And we'll, we're going to incorporate WSUS server, which actually gives us the updates. And we can control updates and we can actually, we spoke about the idea of actually rolling updates instead of actually bringing all, the, all Hyper-Vs down to do an update. We could just update a certain amount based on capacity. So we can actually use live migration and whatnot to move virtual machines from host to host and move them around so that we're freeing up a host or some hosts to be updated. And when they get, get updated, they come back up when we use live migration to move the virtual machines back onto those hosts, freeing up some more hosts so they can be updated. So it's, it's a rolling update, if you like. The vCenter server, that's interesting. Well, remember I mentioned vCenter server in conjunction to VMware vSphere. So what this is actually saying is that with VMM, we can actually use that to manage a vCenter server, which in turn manages a uh, VMware ESXi host and so forth. It's, uh, even though it's possible, it's not ideal. It's not something that you would do as a as a design. I would not go out and design a Hyper-V system with VMM with vCenter and VMware ESXi. That's just silly. Okay, it's more for that migration situation. Okay, so let's say you've already got VMware vSphere implementation. You have virtual machines which are running in that system and we want to swap over to Hyper-V. We can't just cut over just like that because we, we, the whole idea, the whole thing about virtualization, if you were paying attention, is all about uptime and keeping the services available. So as a result, what we can do is actually incorporate both systems and run those VMware virtual machines on the VMware hosts uh, in the meantime. And they'll still work because when they're virtual machines and they're connected to the physical network, the clients don't know if they're uh, Hyper-V virtual machines or uh, VMware virtual machines. So they still work. But this could be a transient situation or a transitional situation where those VMware virtual machines are still running to keep the service going until they get migrated to the Hyper-V uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> so that's infrastructure servers. So these are the servers that make up make up the VMM infrastructure. So if you look at here, when we're actually uh, exploring the VMM or the virtual machine manager, you'll see hosts. This is where your Hyper-Vs live. The, within the infrastructure, you've got the library servers, which host your resources. You've got your PXE servers, which allows you to boot and deploy operating systems to physical hardware. You've got your update server, which is your w, uh, WSUS. Uh, which allows you to update, obviously, all of the operating system, but more importantly, in this aspect, the virtualization infrastructure. You got your vCenter server, which manages VMware. Then we've got networking, which is a big part of the virtualization infrastructure. So we have these things called logical networks, where we define logical networks uh, that is across multiple hosts. This is like defining switches and whatnot. So you'll see the logical switches come up here as well, but they uh, you'll see when we actually work through the labs, they they work together as well as port profiles and so forth. Uh, MAC address pools. So we all know that virtual machines don't necessarily have a fixed uh, MAC address. Load balances to actually spread the load across multiple, multiple hosts or multiple virtual machines. And there's also VIP templates, which allows us to actually create templates of various configuration and use it over and over again to deploy new systems. So the logical switches, but the difference between the, uh, the switches here that we're talking about, so as, uh, as opposed to the virtual switches that we talked about in Hyper-V, is that these log logical switches are configured on VMM, but the configuration is applied across all the Hyper-V hosts that's going to be using it. Port profiles, so again, uh, this is talking about the switch ports. Their profiles, uh, profiles is more is similar to a template. It's something, a configuration for certain ports that you can carry over and use in other situations. There's also port classifications, 
what type of port it is. Uh, is it, you know, like the idea with the Cisco with the access ports and uh, whether they're used for uh, on various VLANs or with the software defined networking. And then there's the networking services. Again, we're talking a lot of things, but we'll explore some of this, these things in more detail as we're going through it. Then there's the storage. Okay, so obviously, if uh, going back to your assignment, if you give me a, a design where you're not using shared storage, okay, when we say shared storage is where the virtual machines are stored on a storage server of some sort that could be fiber channel, fiber channel over Ethernet, iSCSI, uh, SMB free, or even NFS, then it's not going to be correct. Because unless you have that, you're not going to fit the requirements of the assignment where you need redundancies, not redundancies, but the ability to move virtual machines around, uh, clustering maybe, uh, live migration, replicas, all those kind of things, it won't, it won't work. So with this storage, obviously in this case, we can actually classify storage and pools providers. So this is talking about multiple storages, multiple leverages, if you like. And with this classification, we can classify some storage as super fast, some are not so fast, and et cetera, et cetera. The file servers which are participating, or the fiber, op a fiber channel fabric, which is the SAN connected through fiber optics. So if you remember, we earlier in the subject, we spoke about this, this uh, what's a software defined networking, okay? where we said that the actual networking IP addressing or the networking of the virtual machines in their virtual network is independent to the hardware. And we said we, it was a bit of a mind blowing moment because everything we've learned so far in regards to virtualization and virtual computers, uh, virtual machines and them communicating over the network is that uh, they still had to have the same network identity as that of the physical physical environment if they wanted to communicate with the physical environment. But though obviously that's a bit of a limitation because it means that when you move the virtual machine from one network to another network or one site to another site, those IP addresses don't work anymore. And also we can't use the same IP addresses for two different clients. In this case, uh, in this example, we're a hosting company. The corp network is the physical network. And these blue company and red company, they have virtual machines which should be isolated from each other, but they should be able to use this physical network to provide a service to the physical network or the internet. You notice that the IP address is exactly the same. So because they are isolated and because they are independent from the physical network, it really doesn't matter what they use. Because if you remember, we talked about a GRE number. Okay, so if you remember, we spoke about the idea of encapsulation. So encapsulation is wrapping up information in another layer of addressing, in another layer of addressing, in another layer of addressing. Think of where you guys go from data to packets to frames to bits and bytes. Okay, all that has its various levels of addressing. So this is just adding an extra layer of encapsulation. And basically, it actually encapsulates the information that's sent in this network inside of a inside of a, a packet that's got identifying information on the physical network. And so, therefore, these blue virtual machines don't have to be on the same host; they could be on separate, different hosts, and they still can talk to each other, no problems, because when this one sends its information onto the physical network, its information is coming from this, it's going to that, but then it's encapsulated with the IP address of the physical network and where it's going, obviously, and when it gets there, uh, it actually gets decapsulated and it actually looks at that GRE uh, flag and with the number associated with it to know whether it's a blue network or red network and then it gets sent to the right network. So what is network infrastructure? Top of rack switch management and integration. So we're going to call that TOR, top of rack switches. 
So uh, logical network name uh, are named networks that serve a particular function. So for example, blue network, red network. Then there's the Audrey, uh, IP address pool management. So that's IPAM and integration. So IP address pool management and integration. And obviously this is to manage the IP addresses used in a pool. Uh, host and VMs network switch management. So that uh, we obviously manage the host and VM network switches. Load balance integration and auto deployment. Uh, network virtualization deployment management. So if we look at this, these are VMs. Hosts, they use the host NICs to go to the logical network and then uses the top of rack switches. So configuring a logical switch versus configuring a virtual switch. So on the right hand side, you'll see that, hey, this is what we sort of know. Okay, this is what we sort of know already. So if we got Hyper-V1 and Hyper-V2, we want and we want a switch for management, a virtual switch for management. So on Hyper-V1, we'll create a define a virtual switch, which has a physical uplink to the physical network, and we'll call that management. And then we'll say that this virtual machine or that virtual machine is on this switch. And these different colors means that we can even use different VLANs, if you remember, to segregate the traffic if, yeah, a little bit. So, and then we fit, once we're finished with Hyper-V host two, we go to Hyper-V, sorry, when we finish with Hyper-V host one, we go to Hyper-V host two and do pretty much exactly the same thing. And if we had 2000, Hyper-V host 2000, we do every one of them up to 2000, meaning a lot of work. So, how's that different to the logical switch then? So instead of doing this on each particular Hyper-V host, we're going to do on the VMN server. We're going to create a switch with various settings and we're going to uh, d d define the port profiles for the uplink. So in this case, there could be an uplink for management corporate clustering. And then we say that uh, this particular logical switch is for management. So we use this pro port profile. And then, uh, and then once we define it once and we apply it to the, all the host that's meant to be using this, then it's only done once. You get me? So it's simplifying management to extent. So it sounds comp more complicated right now, but once you know, know it, it's actually going to simplify and make it easier to manage all these Hyper-Vs. Uh, so using virtual machine networks for isolating networks. So virtual machine network features it's built on top of uh, logical networks and allows you to use several virtualization networks on the one logical network. Uh, without isolation, there can only be one virtual machine network per logical network. Okay, so it's bit, uh, so obviously if you have one logical network, only one network is there. This kind of virtual machine network uses logical network to communicate. Uh, VLANs and private VLANs are configured at the logical network. The virtual machine the networks work well for many other uh, many situations, not just for hosts. Let's look look at, look at the storage. So storage options for server virtualization. When you do storage planning for virtualization hosts, you should use high performance connectivity to storage. So again, now getting back to our assignments, I'm trying to give you as many tips as I can while we're doing these. <clears throat> If you, in your design, your, uh, your uh, hosts and your storage, as well as e for everything else, and you're just using the one network card for everything, it's probably not a good, good plan. So ideally, for every purpose, storage, yeah, communicating with the physical network, communicating for live migration, communicating for management, communicating for failover clustering, and all that, you should have at least two network in interface cards and if you obviously depends on how much budget you have it could it should also be very high speed because don't forget the amount of traffic that's going through a production uh hyper v network interface card is going to be a ho whole lot higher because each of the, those virtual machines is providing a service to the network um getting back to the storage use high performance connectivity to the storage so that's to the SAN, 
to the SMB free, whatever, but it, and it should be more than one network card. Implement redundant storage. Obviously, the redundancy we've spoken about that in the past with RAID and whatnot. But even SAN clusters is a possibility. So instead of clustering servers, you're clustering SANs so that they they actually cook in a in a cluster. Uh, you can analyze the current storage usage. So there's no point just giving them some storage. If we talk about the assignment, there's no point just giving them amount of storage. How do you know that's sufficient? How do you know it's not enough? How do you know it's too much? You don't know. You need to analyze what they're using right now and determine and also determine the storage performance. So if you give them a storage server that has only mechanical hard drives, for example, that's probably not great. But if you give them a storage where you at least have some solid state, some mechanical, and they're working in some sort of tiered storage, that possibly is a lot better. A plan for adequate space for existing virtualization needs and also future growth. So don't forget that. So always scalability is the key, uh, one of the keywords in IT. You don't want to outgrow the solution when you actually take deliver it, delivery of it. So it shouldn't just meet your existing needs. It should give you a ability to add to it, grow. And uh, so even if it's um, more than what you need right now, but even better, it should be modular so that you can just keep on adding to it. Just like with the virtualization infrastructure, you might give them 10 hosts because they actually only need five. So give them 10, just for example. Um, but you know that if we need more processing power, more memory, and all that kind of stuff, we can just add new hosts, new hosts, new hosts, and grow in the future. With the storage, a similar idea. So if you just use a, a JBOD, for example, and you have capacity for 20 disks, but you only give them 10 disks, then you can just add more disks to that, uh, to that, uh, infra uh, sorry, to that chassis. And in fact, with JBODs, you can add additional chassis. So you can actually expand the array of disks and add to it, add to it. And if you talk about the scale out file server, Instead of actually just adding more disk to chassis, you can actually add more uh, file servers to your storage. Ensure you include data protection, such as backups and offsite replication. So definitely, that's uh, that's just uh, very important. So offsite replication that should trigger some uh, thoughts for most of you guys. We spoke about replication already, Hyper-V replicas. So these in our assignment, there's actually two sites, isn't there? LA site, lizard site. Doesn't that sound like it's an ideal situation for implementing their Hyper-V replica? Okay, and don't forget, you don't you don't even have to implement replicas between two of your sites. It could be from your site to a cloud provider, um, so such as Zetagrid or someone like that, or Amazon Web Services, or Obviously, we're doing a Microsoft subject Azure, so we're replicating these hype, uh, these hyper -rep hyper V replicas to a to a, if you like, a second site in the cloud. Implement block storage. So block storage is basically where the storage is treated at a uh, at a block level. Well, how's that different? Let's think of it this way: when you actually are copying a file from from your computer to a file server, like because you shared it on the file server, like we've been learning about, you are not accessing that file server at a block level. You are not telling it how to read or write the data. You are basically saying, please say uh, write this data to the storage. And then that server that is probably using SMB or SMB3 or something like that, is then determining how to read or write to the actual hardware itself. So you're not in full control. You, the person who wanted to write that data, is not in full control of how that data is read or written to. Whereas if you implement files, uh, fiber storage or fiber optics, fiber channels, uh, or virtual fiber channels, or implement iSCSI, that is block level access, which means you as the Hyper-V server 
can tell it how exactly to read and write to the storage. You are treating it like an internal local disk rather than a disk that's in the network. Or we can choose some of these other options. Like I said, the SMB3 is what we've been pushing in this Microsoft course, and no surprise there, but to be honest, if you're not talking about Microsoft, the world uses uh, Fiber Channel, Fiber Channel over the internet, or iSCSI. There's more occurrence of that than the SMB3 in real life. So the difference between these two, NFS and SMB3, is like just what we said. It's not a block level storage. So it still works. It's just that you're not in full control of how the file is read and uh, written. And that's why you need SMB3, not just any SMB. Because SMB3, if you remember, is actually a share for applications rather than your simple sharing that you've done in the past. SMB3 enables, uh, enables the virtual machine storage on an SMB3 file share and requires, obviously, server 2012 or newer and requires fast network connectivity. It provides redundancy and performance benefits. Sounds like a Microsoft ad. It's, it's a bit like that. NFS, we should know that that stands for Network File System is more uh, associated with X. But having said that, we can also create NFS shares on our server, Microsoft server subjects, uh, server virtual, uh, machines. But you typically Linux based. <clears throat> En enables you to use NFS shares to deploy VMware uh, to, uh, to virtual machines. Uh, deploying storage in Virtual Machine Manager. So, so basically, that's just a fixed storage. But obviously, with combining uh, talking about it in the context of Virtual Machine Manager or VMM, after adding storage to VMM, you can deploy logical units or lungs. And that's what they're called using two SAM methods. So you can use snapshots. Uh, with this method, the SAM creates a writable snapshot for existing logical units. So basically, we can just say copy here, a new place. Or we can cloning. So basically, with the with the snapshot, it's a it's a it creates a writable snapshot of the logical unit, which means that the other part which is actually being snapshotted is locked for a bit like what we understand with the virtual machines but we write to the writable uh, logical unit with the cloning just as it sounds it creates a clone with this method the same creates an independent copy of the uh, logical unit and this does not have any relationship to the the one that you copied uh, in, uh, after the fact after you cloned it whereas the snapshot obviously still a relationship because that uh, it's actually basing the data on on the previous lung. So it's a bit like uh, full clone versus link clone, uh, sorry, full clone versus link clone idea with these two. The method used must be supported by the SAN vendor. So it basically depends on hardware who's selling it to you and what they support. After integration, you can deploy logical units and storage pools by using the VMM console or the PowerShell commandlets. Infrastructure updates. So we all know that infrastructure updates are very important. So basically, it's so uh, it's very important. We all know from a security functionality and bug bug fix point, it's very very important. So infrastructure updates. So you can integrate VMN and Windows Server Update Service or WSUS to provide scanning compliance of your virtualization infrastructure. So that means every server that's part of your infrastructure, your, your Hyper-V host, your VMM server itself, the SQL database, the virtual machines, as well as other services that might be you might be using, all need to be updated. So what this is saying is by integrating WSUS, we all know what WSUS is, into this VMM, we can actually control WSUS, if you like, from VMM. And again, I know I'll harp on this a little bit. Again, this re is reminiscent of what we were talking about in the four SCCM subject that some of you guys have done, where in that subject we controlled the updates with the 
systems in the configuration manager. So same idea. Configuring a fabric update. So the fabric is where we'll call the whole thing. Okay, the whole thing, the whole virtualization infrastructure is called a fabric. Okay, it's a fabric because it actually extends across all the things that make up the fabric. There's no, no, uh, no, it, it's continuous in the sense that it all becomes one big unit. A process for implementing update management in VMM. So obviously we enable update manager, management. We configure and manage update baselines. So that's the important word. That's the same word that we use in VMware as we do in uh, Hyper-V or Microsoft. Baseline is almost like what is the minimum set that is acceptable. Okay, set updates. So there's some pre-configured uh, baselines that you can incorporate, which basically all the critical updates are applied. That could be your baseline. So basically when what happens is that uh, then you start a scan to determine compliance status. So basically, it will scan the infrastructure service like a Hyper-V and it will compare it to this baseline. So with this baseline, if it says all critical updates are applied, it's 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 a it's a constantly updating moving moving benchmark, isn't it? Or moving baseline. Because we all know that Microsoft release patches and updates constantly weekly, uh, sorry, monthly. And these critical updates, new critical updates all the time. So basically, this baseline is not just a set and for, it's not one of those things where it's, it's you create it and it goes out of date because you have to spe specify the specific updates. No, it's talking about all critical updates, for example. And so therefore, any new critical updates will become part of this baseline. So it will, it will group all these critical updates as part of this baseline. So now when the VMM, uh, what well, it's us really, through VMM, scans these uh, Hyper-V servers, for example, it will say, has it got all the critical updates? If it does, then it's compliant, as in it's passed. If it hasn't, then it's non-compliant, so it's failed. So it's obviously, it's not good to fail, so that's the status, compliance status. It's either compliant or non-compliant, which basically means does it have all those updates in the baseline. Uh, if it's not, if it's not meeting the uh, compliance, it's not compliant, then what we have to do is do what's called a remediation. If you've never heard of them, remedial work or remediation is to fix something up. So you might remediate the landscape after mining. You might have heard that in the newspaper. These big miners have to do remediation work onto the, on, uh, on the public lands. Basically, they have to fix up the land after they mine. You might have heard of the in a in a situation where someone is doing remedial mass uh, at school well that just means that they're doing mass to allow them to fix their lack of knowledge in mass based on where they are let's say they're doing year seven and they might have to do remedial mass because they didn't pick up everything they should have got in year four or four five and six so remediation means to fix so in this case with regards to compliance of to baselines and updates is if you don't have the updates you're non-compliant so to fix it you have to install the updates and that's what remediation is but it's not as simple as that because we know that if we update a host and need, needs to do a restart those virtual machines which are on the host will also go down if you do nothing <clears throat> so if you configure nothing and you do nothing they will go down with the host but we also know that we've talked about live migrate for and we also know that we, uh, we've mentioned that we had, can do what's called rolling updates. So basically, with, uh, when we perform an update remediation, we can actually do that on a rolling basis so that those virtual machines and therefore their services are continuously online, even though the host is being remediated because virtual machines are moved off them, they get remediated, they restart, they turn back on, and then the hosts are moved back on them and freeing, freeing up other hosts to be remediated and so forth. So it's a rolling update. We can also specify update exemptions. So if we really don't care about this update or this doesn't apply to us, and if in fact this update causes problems, we can actually exempt it from our baselines. So that would be on rare occasions. That'll be in the rarity. We'll be hardly ever do that, but you can. 
So planning and update baseline. So like I said, it's a set of rules of what should it have and uh, what should be the minimum that it has as far as updates goes. So an update baseline is a set of required updates assigned to a scope. The scope is what is what is going to get this. Okay, it's just like uh, if I said uh, to my, you, you guys now, all the people with brown eyes, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand. Okay, let's uh, let's do this for real. So all everyone with brown eyes, raise your hand now. Okay, so that's uh, Walter and Reese. So I'm assuming Navdeep, your 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 person who don't have brown eyes. All right, I'm asking if you do have if you have no. blue eyes, you don't have brown eyes. What color are your eyes? Uh, dark brown, like it's black and dark brown. Uh, Brown is still brown, okay? So raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a bit of activity to show you. So now you can see that if I'm saying all people with brown eyes raise your hand, the scope of what I'm talking about or the scope or the people I'm talking to are really Reese, Walter, and Navdeep. That is what we call a scope. All those people outside the scope are Ayrton, Matthew, and Nicholas. And that's fine. So basically, you can rate, uh, lower your hand if you like now. So when we're talking about this uh, scope, is who does this baseline apply to? Okay, so we define the scope. A bit like how we define the scope in the group policies when we applied it to OUs and so, uh, def, uh, so forth. So the scope of the infrastructure servers within the private cloud. So which infrastructure servers get this baseline? If this is a Hyper-V only baseline that's specific to Hyper-Vs, then there's no point including the storage servers or the WSUS or the VMM or the SQL server in this scope. You see how what I'm getting at? So if we assign the baseline to a scope, which is basically host or host groups, uh, if you move the host or host cluster to a new host group, the objects, will, uh, these host or host group, uh, this, these host or host clusters will inherit the baseline associated with that target host group. So basically, you assign baselines to host groups. Okay, so if you forgot, host groups are group of Hyper-V servers. If you assign a baseline specifically to a standalone host or host cluster so we can assign it to a host host group or host cluster if we assign it to a host or cluster the baseline will actually stay with the host or host cluster and even if you move it to a different host group it will just it will just stay with it you see what i'm talking about so if we actually if you let's say you got two baselines one to the host group and one to the host you get both basically you get both. You get basically the updates for the host group, and you get the updates for the uh, the host. And uh, well, if they're the same updates, it doesn't really matter. You get all of it. They just add together. And when you're doing a baseline uh, compliance scan, then you will scan against both uh, baselines. And if you're uh, non-compliant for any of it in each, either one, you'll be non-compliant. Okay, update con server considerations. So when you're integrating WSUS to, into VMM, you'd need to have WSUS 3.0 SP2 or newer. And obviously, similar to when we talked about uh, WSUS in the past, if you if this WSUS is purely for the virtualization infrastructure, don't choose things which is outside the, outside of that scope. If you only use English. In Australia, then you should limit the languages in to English, because basically, what have you just include English, Chinese, and uh, Hindi, for example? So I'm trying to be inclusive. Uh, and Walter, which country do you come from? I'm from South Africa. South Africa. Uh, Afrikaans is that the language? That's correct. Yeah. So basically, if we if we had a situation where we are a multinational company and we have uh, clients who are Hindi, use Hindi, Chinese, English, and African, 
then we will include all those languages. And basically, that what that means is if it was an update, security patch, you would download it in Afrikaan, English, Chinese, and Hindi. So you download in the same update about four times because you, you've selected four languages. So what I'm saying is if there's no requirement for those languages, don't select any other language besides the one you need. Also products, like I said, if this is for virtualization infrastructure, there's no need to, uh, to, to download uh, products like, for example, uh, off, uh, Microsoft Office or Internet Explorer or stuff like that because most of the time you're probably going to take away Internet Explorer on servers such as these. Uh, just an example. And obviously classifications, uh, so you should limit the, what you select. The more you select, the more downloads, the more space, the more bandwidth, all those kind of things. Integration with uh, Configuration Manager is possible. So if you, for, again, for those of you who've done SCCM, configure, they're talking about Configuration, which is the System Center Configuration Manager here. So you can actually use System Center Virtual Machine Manager and integrate it with System Center Configuration Manager, which gives you a, a very, very complicated system. And it's really for the very largest organizations that you would do that. Um, so integration with Configuration Manager is possible if WSUS is managed by Configuration Manager. Also, you, we can use the reporting capabilities for compliance information. Okay, Hyper-V clustering. So we all know what clustering is, hopefully. And for some of you guys, this will be a relevant recap because you probably have to do that demo and explain it to me. With failover clustering, with, uh, now with, uh, this is a bit of a recap, uh, you can have up to 64 physical servers in a cluster and up to 60, uh, 6,000 virtual machines which are protected. You need this cluster shared volume, so shared storage, on shared storage because the way it works is that we have all these hosts Four hosts, node one, two, three, and oh well, 64 nodes by the, that example. 64 nodes, and on each of those nodes, there's a certain amount of capacity, and these blue things are virtual machines. And basically, if this host fails for whatever reason, hardware related specifically to this host, then those virtual machines, which are deemed as protected virtual machines, are simply uh, that this host outage is recognized by all the other hosts because of the heartbeat. And if that dies, they recognize it, and in, they also know that these two virtual machines were running on this host because they're the protected virtual machine. And as a result, if there's capacity on these other hosts, they would just simply open up the files from the shared storage and start it on this host, or this host, or on any other host which has capacity. Uh, it's built-in hardware and software validation, so we need to validate whether the hosts are capable or whether they're similar, because you can't just restart a virtual machine on another host and expect everything to be exactly the same configuration. So we spoke about how, what if you don't even have the same switches? What if that's the, on, a different, uh, on a different subnet or so forth? So you have to validate that so that they do have all the same things uh, before they can be in a cluster. Um, so shared storage, again, SMB free, iSCSI, Fiber Channel, Fiber Channel over Ethernet, or serially attached SCSI, SAS. So that's a very quick overview of uh, uh, failover clustering. And then, then VM, with VMM, we can also do dynamic optimization. We spoke about this before, but basically this dynamic optimization is not possible on the Hyper-V without, without VMM. Okay, so it is possible, but it's not possible without VMM. So we might have mentioned it before, but, but basically the way it works is that resource utilization. Okay, we've got these hosts, and this one's got three virtual machines on top. And this one's got one, this one's got two. And obviously, these are they are using the resources on that particular host. Okay, so if we look at this resource utilization graph, time of day. Whoa, these guys are all in the green, so they're all good. They're all happy within the within the boundaries or the threshold of what's uh, what's okay. So you can see there's a threshold, but you can see that the, the one of them has gone above the threshold. The threshold is a bit like, at what point do we do something? 
So you can see that this is the one with the problem. It's got a warning because it's not it's not uh, critical just yet, but it's a bit of a warning because it's gone past the threshold. It's gone past the threshold, and the problem is, it's uh, these virtual machines are so busy, it's actually using up more resources than it should. Whereas these ones are all just laid back, chillaxing because they they're not really under much stress at all, and that doesn't seem fair, does it? Exactly, chilled out. So that, that doesn't seem fair that uh, this guy's working so uh, this guy's working so hard, or this uh, this host is working so hard, and these other hosts are take uh, chilling. So what? And also, uh, in a, besides just being silly like that, in a serious matter, is when there's lack of resources or there's contention for resources, uh, these virtual machines will actually be affected. If there's not enough RAM or whatever, they will actually slow down, which therefore slows down the responsiveness and becomes slow, like Matthew said, for the users. So there's actually a not it's not just about equality; it's about performance. Okay, seriously, it's about performance, not about equality. There's no such thing as equality in IT. Um, so basically, what can we do? Well, if these guys have plenty of resources and they're just chilling out, like we said, the sensible thing would be if we saw this as administrators, as humans, we can easily say, just move this one over or move this one over. And that's what dynamic optimization actually does. It uses the capability of live migration to move those uh, virtual machines which are on the server which is being uh, super taxed uh, and they move it so they, yeah they, they try to achieve this balance but obviously balance can't be uh, probably most of the time can't be exactly balanced but in this case it, as long as it's uh, uh, within that threshold then it's happy so now it brings all of them back to within that threshold Whoa, the next thing is, hey, this guy, we moved this virtual machine over here, but this now suddenly has become busy. You know how it is. The fact is the usage of various services changes throughout the day. So right first thing in the morning, it might be the, the authentication server. Uh, during the day, it might be the file server. Uh, towards, the, towards the lunchtime, it might be the proxy server. So, you know. Just uh, making those wild assumptions there, uh, but uh, but usage changes throughout the day. We all know that, okay? Uh, just think of Netflix usage during the day, probably not very high, but usage uh, after 5 p.m. probably a lot higher. Except for when everyone's studying at home, then Netflix is probably out off the charts all the time. Okay, so now this is out of balance over the threshold. So what we can do is again. Again, use that dynamic optimization and move it around, and thus achieving balance or keeping all of them within the threshold. Okay, uh, so so basically that's uh, similar to VMware vSphere DRS, and that's dynamic resource scheduler, uh, and basically it just balances the resource usage across the host. Uh, obviously, makes sense to hopefully makes sense to everyone because. It's all about giving the best performance to the users. Then there's the power optimization. This is a little bit different. This is not actually to do with resource usage, sort of. It's more to do with saving, saving power when there's less demand. It's, so it's, it is to do with resource usage because we know that uh, in our normal busy hours, like let's think about it, at, at uh, work, we work nine to five. So uh, basically, the servers that we're virtualizing at our office is going to be used a lot more between nine to five than between uh, than after five p.m. So therefore, during the day, uh, the resource utilization is is uh, let's say this is nine over here. It's going up, fluctuating, and now it's getting towards the end of the day. People are clocking off, and let's say this is five p.m. People are going home and Use uh, resource use, uh, huh? Oh, yeah, on prem. Yes, it's on prem. Okay, so all of this, what we're talking about is on prem. We're not discussing Azure on or uh, Amazon Web Services. All of what we're discussing is on prem. Okay, or it could be a hybrid situation, but all of this is on prem. If uh, if we did a if we did a class on Amazon Web Services or Azure, then 
it probably wouldn't be on prem. Uh, Matthew, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I just I just wanted to clarify based on what I mm -hmm. said. Um, when I say users on prem, can this also be people like working from home in in your particular ah, situation? No, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Okay, so I, mean, I I I thought you meant. Um, I thought you meant whether the virtualization was on-prem. No, no, you're right. That they could be offering services which is available you know, externally as well, extranet applications, definitely. Yeah. So yes, if that's what you meant, yes. Yeah. Okay, and obviously we're well, making a bit of assumptions with that thing talking about 5 p.m. But even if they're off-prem, like pe people like me and you and everyone now, it's still most likelihood is that we're accessing it between nine and five because that's when our normal classes are on. But after after five, we'll probably have less and less subjects and people are going to sleep. So it, the resource utilization could be dropping even if they're not, the users themselves are not on-prem, but they live in Australia and that's where all our clients are, okay? So they would be going to sleep, except for Matthew who's staying up late to, he's, he's just woke up and he's staying up late to do some uh, extra homework because the amount of homework I'm giving him is not enough so he wants to do some extra so he sparks up the utilization then eventually at 2 a.m. he falls asleep too okay so we're saying that it, the resource utilization hit goes down drops so much it hits another threshold okay once this threshold is uh, hit no problems use live migration move Consolidate some of the virtual machines onto the other servers because there's not that much demand for resources. In fact, we can now just turn off that server altogether and save some power. Uh, no problems. And then from uh, when Matthew went to sleep, 2 a.m. to 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 6 a.m., he's just woken up again. He only needs four hours sleep, and he wants to get straight back onto his homework. So uh, so now he's driving up the utilization on our servers again. And it's hit that re, uh, threshold again. And what happens is that now it's hit that threshold and that host that was put to sleep uh, gets back, turned back on. And then, uh, then the virtual machines get moved over with, uh, with uh, live migration. And then the normal day begins again. And, uh, and other, other students uh, show up at TAFE and so forth. And that compares to vSphere DPM dynamic power management, okay?